Hello everyone, welcome to my brand new setup. I've been working on this for like a couple weeks now and I've just, I really wanted to have like a semblance of production value for the first time in like what, eight years of, of doing this as a job. But yeah, I really hope it's a bit of an upgrade from staring at the same computer background for like five years. Anyway, I really wanted to do a video talking about cartoon movies, but not like cartoons based on movies or live action movies of cartoons. I mean like movie specials of cartoons. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? The fucking SpongeBob movie. That's what, we're, that's what we're talking about. I fucking love these things because they they will never not feel like an event. You get like generally 20 minute episodes upgraded into like an hour or an hour and a half. And it's always this opportunity for them to be way more ambitious with it, improve the animation, hire some Judge extremely Nelson. unnecessary celebrity voice actors while also having to appeal to newer audiences because these things cost money and they need a lot of people to see them. So generally what you end up with is like the best the show has to offer. So that's what we're talking about today, not the Inspector Gadget movie. So I really wanted to talk about a few of my favorite ones. I basically spent this last month trying to watch as many of these as I possibly could. Uh, again, even for some shows that I haven't actually seen. So we have a lot to get through, so I'm gonna have to be quick. Of course, we gotta start with my personal favorite of all time, no bias at all. I absolutely adore the Transformers the movie because whoever made this film absolutely fucking despises children. <laughs> This is the most violent, cold-hearted fucking movie I've ever seen in my life. If you were a child in 1986 and you were really excited to see Optimus Prime on the big screen, you were about to have the worst hour and a half of your entire life. For those who haven't seen it, this movie basically goes, we have all these new toys we have to sell and we have a bunch of old toys that aren't selling anymore. So how about we fucking horrifically murder all of these characters and just bring in all of these new guys and hope no one cares. The first like half hour is the Battle of Autobot City, which is a brutal massacre of so many important characters from the first two seasons of the show. Of course, the most iconic death is Optimus Prime, which I like to regard as one of the biggest, like, oops <laughs> moments of all time. The amount of shit they got from distraught children after this movie came out. Anyway, horrific robot violence aside, this movie goes all out with, like, the celebrity voices. Almost all of the new characters are voiced by someone famous. Judd Nelson does Hot Rod. Leonard Nimoy plays Galvatron. They got fucking Orson Welles to do Unicron? What 10 year old child gives a shit about Orson Welles? I'm not saying it's not an amazing performance, but like why? The animation is incredible. It makes the G1 cartoon look so bad in comparison. Transformers the movie didn't do super well when it came out. Critics didn't like it that much and it didn't make a lot of money, but I love this movie so much. There is like genuine love put into it. I just think there was some like studio mandate from Hasbro that was like, okay, we don't need those toys anymore. Just violently murder them. I'm sure the, ch <laughs> I'm sure the children won't mind. Anyway, I've seen Transformers the movie like five times. I love it so much. It's easily my favorite one. I do really want to talk about it in its own separate video one day because I think I could literally talk about it forever. I love it to absolute pieces, but I'm betting most people watching this video don't really care about Transformers. So anyway, moving on. The next one is the Simpsons movie, which I think I watched about a bajillion times as a kid, which I definitely shouldn't have in hindsight. The Simpsons movie was a pretty big deal when it came out, but I've heard that there's quite a few people who don't like it that much, but I've seen this too many times to not love it. And the plot, which is like, Homer ends up dumping so much radioactive waste into Springfield that it fucks the entire town. So the EPA has to come in and dome them all in. And the movie follows the Simpsons abandoning everyone in Springfield and just fucking off to Alaska. There's a lot of good character stuff. I, I really love the stuff with Homer and Bart, especially, and, and Marge and Homer. Also, it gave birth to Spider Pig, which which for anyone that was around yeah, in 2007, like you'd probably hear about 15 times a day. I just think I rewatched it so much as a kid that it doesn't even feel like a real movie anymore. So I don't really know what to say about it, but I really would love to see them do another one. I think they have been talking about doing a sequel to the Simpsons movie for a while. I watched South Park, Bigger, Longer and Uncut as well, which is a musical for some reason, which is gonna be a recurring theme with the rest of these, which I absolutely loved, even though I've never seen South Park. That for me was always that show that my parents wouldn't let me watch. The Simpsons was fine, but South Park was pushing it. It's just so much fun to watch because you can actually see how much fun they were having with the fact that they weren't bound by TV censorship anymore. So they were actually allowed to swear now. So they spend the first half an hour of the movie swearing as much as humanly possible. What I said was... <laughs> How would you like to suck my balls, Mr. Gershie? 
I read somewhere that it won a Guinness World Record for the most amount of profanities in an animated movie with 139 uses of fuck and 399 total profanities. Obviously very stiff competition at the time with Shrek. Anyway, the actual plot of this film is that a Terrence and Philip movie is released and begins immediately corrupting the minds of the children, which is their explanation for why they haven't been swearing before. The budget really kicks in with the scenes where Kenny goes to hell after setting himself on fire. And that's where all of the expensive CG animation is put. Otherwise, the rest of the movie looks pretty much the same as the show, which I think is hilarious. It's got a lot of good stuff in there, making fun of how stupid the reaction to movie violence is from both parents and the MPAA. But anyway, a movie that was relentlessly making fun of the ratings board unsurprisingly caused quite a bit of issues with the ratings board. Just remember what the MPAA says. Horrific, deplorable violence is okay as long as people don't say any naughty words. This was the only theatrically released South Park movie, but they've done a whole bunch more now on Paramount. I think there's something stupid like 14 of them they're doing, but I'm very doubtful they'll ever try and put one out to cinemas ever again after the amount of hell they had to go through in order to get this one released. All right, anyway, let's talk about the SpongeBob movie, which is an iconic childhood classic, regardless of who you are. And rewatching it now, I think I liked it even more than when I was younger, which was probably because I had a bootleg DVD copy of it as a kid. I don't know where my parents kept getting those from. In this one, Mr. Krabs opens a second Krusty Krab, but then gets framed by Plankton for stealing King Neptune's crown. So SpongeBob and Patrick have to go all the way outside of Bikini Bottom to a place called Shell City to find it before Mr. Krabs fucking dies. It's a really good setup for a movie like length adventure. What really makes the Spongebob movie stand out to me is in like the last half hour because when they finally get to Shell City it brings them into the real world which is really cool except they have this diver that scared the absolute shit out of me as a kid. I was very intimidated by the live action diver. There's this bit where Spongebob and Patrick are put under a lamp and are turned into real objects. That shit traumatized me as a kid more than the Transformers movie ever could. No wonder they never leave Bikini Bottom in the show. Everything outside of it is fucking terrifying. Obviously, they knew that the live action segments were the coolest part because at least from what I've seen from trailers, they built the entire sequel around that exact idea except with 3D animation. But I didn't get to watch that or the third movie in time, unfortunately. I know, what a loser. The SpongeBob movie is a perfect example of everything good about a theatrically released cartoon movie. Whoever came up with David Hasselhoff appearing out of nowhere and being crucial to the climax by launching SpongeBob and Patrick down to Bikini Bottom using his pecs should probably be running Nickelodeon, I think. Next is Beavis and Butthead do America. And while I didn't grow up with Beavis and Butthead because I'm not 30, with this movie being my first experience with them, I have to say it is probably the most immature thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And I'm kind of into it. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to survive an entire movie of Beavis and Butthead noises, but after like the 15th time of them laughing at the word enough. anus, it starts to wear you down a bit. Attention. We're looking for the chick with big boobs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are ready to do you now. <laughs> This one is a perfect example of how these movies go absolutely crazy with the plot. Beavis and Butthead get their TV stolen, and this causes a chain of events that ends with them being hunted by the FBI for accidentally smuggling a deadly neurotoxin. I love movies where the entire plot occurs around two characters who have no idea what's going on. It is extremely, extremely stupid and I highly recommend it. They did a sequel this year as well with the straight to streaming Beavis and Butthead do the universe, which I also liked, but not as much, but I'm just glad to see that these two idiots are still around. Uh, oh yeah, Batman Mask of the Phantasm as well. I promised Batman the animated series is on my list of things to watch, but even on its own, this movie is so, so good. This one was actually meant to be straight to video, but because it took so long to make, they ended up releasing it in theaters. And it's a really good thing that they did because it just feels like such a big movie, you know? I would have killed to have seen this in cinema. They give you a look into the origin story of Bruce becoming Batman, where he has to break up with his then girlfriend at the time because he's too Sigma for that. Who then comes back as a villain in the present called the Phantasm, who's tracking down the killer of her father, who of course turns out to be the Joker. Oh no. 
They did do a few more movies based on the animated series, but all of those were straight to video. Uh, and I haven't seen any of them except for Return of the Joker, but I accidentally watched the censored version of it. So, ew. Oh yeah, Pokemon. <laughs> Considering how big Pokemon was in the 90s, Pokemon the first movie must have felt like an event. And I know technically this one is an anime, but I wanted to include it here anyway, okay. In this, Ash, Misty, and Brock encounter Mewtwo, who is a Pokemon that can battle without a trainer. <gasps> what? He can't do that? A Pokemon can't be a Pokemon master? No way! Quiet, human. The first 20 or so minutes, you get Mewtwo's backstory, uh, where he was created in a lab from Mew's DNA by Team Rocket. And they actually raise some really existential questions in this one about the meaning of life and your purpose in it. I'm imagining all of the kids in the audience who just want to watch Pikachu fight someone while Mewtwo was having an existential crisis. Eventually, Ash and some other random trainers get summoned to Mewtwo's castle so he can clone their Pokemon. And Mew just kind of shows up as well. I don't even know if he knows what's going on. Watching this one for like the fourth time made me realize it's actually a bit more smaller scale than I remember it being. For the Pokemon show, which was just battling random trainers and a terrorist organization, I guess Mewtwo wanting to conquer humanity would have been a pretty huge step up. But when you think about it, instead of him threatening world leaders or anyone important, it's just like Ash and like three other random guys. And when they do get to the castle, almost the rest of the entire movie takes place there. The sequel has definitely stepped it up in terms of scale to kind of make the first movie look quaint almost by comparison, but essentially all Ash had to do was die to change Mewtwo's mind. Of course, they've done like a billion other movies since then, almost I think yearly, which I'm definitely not going to have time to talk about, but I just really wanted to talk about the first movie because I feel like it's so iconic as a big theatrically released cartoon movie. They also made a direct follow-up to it with a TV special called Mewtwo Returns, where Ash and Mewtwo become good friends. Wait till I call Professor Oak and tell him about this. You will tell no one. And then on the other hand, you have the Digimon movie, which I like to think was slapped together as a response to the success of the Pokemon movie, but the Pokemon movie didn't have Angelina Anaconda, so eat shit, Pikachu. Whereas the Pokemon movie was a big theatrically released movie in Japan that they just dubbed in America, the Digimon movie is three separate movies sort of Frankenstein together to form this very, very weird hour and a half. The first is a prologue that shows Tai meeting Agumon for the first time and having this fucking awesome kaiju battle in the city. What's mom gonna say if she finds out? It can't get any worse. <laughs> And then the second part, which is the one that everyone likes, is Ty and Matt having to defeat Diablomon, a Digimon that uploads itself into the internet and almost launches nuclear missiles on the world, and they have to defeat him with shitty 2000s computers. This was also the debut of Omnimon, which even uh, for non-Digimon fans like me, is the fucking coolest Digimon ever. The third part, though, is where it always kind of lost me, because they introduce a bunch of new characters who we've never met before, who I know are the protagonists of Digimon Adventure 2, but I'm pretty sure when this movie came out, that show hadn't come out yet, and it is the longest part of the three, so it just feels like it goes on forever. Having seen the Digimon movie like three times, I thought it might be good to actually go and watch the three separate movies on their own, and holy shit, they are so much better. Not that I don't like the Digimon movie, but they really do butcher some of it in the dub. Prepare for battle, you pathetic Pukemon! The first, which is just called Digimon Adventure, is like so well-crafted and atmospheric. I can't really describe it unless you actually see it, but it's only like 20 minutes long. But it's a 20 minute short that someone directed the shit out of. <laughs> And then the sequel to it, Our War Game, which again, everyone's favorite part, is even better on its own uh, because they actually cut a lot of it out in the Digimon movie. There's a whole bunch of other stuff. There's more of like a ticking clock aspect to it that really makes it more suspenseful, I think. There's much more with Matt and TK having to find a computer in rural Japan just so they can log on and use their Digimon, which is fucking hilarious. I love the huge stakes in such a small setting. They have to deal with this world-ending threat in like their fucking mum office room with the shittiest computer known to man. I cannot praise these two shorts enough. I love them so much. The third one though, which is called uh, Digimon Hurricane Landing slash Transcendent Evolution. Okay. Is, yeah, still my least favorite of the three, but it is, again, a lot better as a whole. It's actually an hour long on its own, so they cut the shit out of it for the Digimon movie. And you definitely get much more of a sense of cohesion in the series, because they actually acknowledge the original Adventure Kids in this one, whereas in the Digimon movie, they completely cut them out for some reason, even though that would have made more sense. The only link between the three shorts in the Digimon movie is some narration they added to pretend that these two movies are related. The Rugrats movies! Okay. 
Okay, obviously Rugrats was so popular in the 90s that Nickelodeon tried their hand at a theatrical movie, which unlike a lot of the horror shows in this video, actually did really well. Enough for it to get a sequel, which I'll get to in a minute. But I gotta be honest, I didn't actually like this one that much. It was meant to be a musical, but they ended up cutting all but one of the songs for the final release, which is probably because all of the babies sound like dying cats. In this one, all of the Rugrats end up getting lost in the woods through a combination of really bad parenting, as well as the birth of Tommy's new younger brother, Dill, who is the most annoying character in anything ever made, I think. To the point where Tommy tries to murder him at some point by putting a bunch of peanut butter on him and leaving him in the jungle to get eaten by monkeys. Was he so wrong? I'm really glad I ended up watching the sequel anyway, though, because I liked it a lot more. Rugrats in Paris obviously sees the whole family going on a trip to, you guessed it, a Japanese theme park in Paris. Tokyo sure looks a different on TP, huh? Tokyo? Don't you know nothing? This is Paris! This one introduces the new character, Kimmy, who was a much more welcome addition than fucking Dill. And the whole thing's about them trying to stop Chucky's dad from marrying Coco, who owns the park they go to. Which sounds like a pretty straightforward premise, but then the movie ends with a Pacific Rim kaiju battle with a mecha reptar that Tommy's dad built. So you can see why I like this one more. I didn't get to catch the third one in time, which is a crossover with the wild thornberries, but you know, ended on a high note with Rugrats in Paris having a Godfather reference in the first minute, so it's gonna be pretty hard to top that. Okay, almost there, the Powerpuff Girls movie. Without having seen the show, I'm gonna say it's a safe bet to assume that they kind of just jump straight into it and only give you an explanation for them in the first like 30 seconds of the intro. Because I was surprised that this one is actually a prequel for the events of the show with like what happened immediately after they were made, which is an interesting way to go about doing a movie, I think, because it's like the ultimate way to make sure that it appeals to people who haven't seen the show. So thank you. I was thinking that it was maybe because Cartoon Network got cold feet with it and sort of didn't give it the super massive budget that say like the SpongeBob movie would have had. And they turned out to be right in that department because this one did not make a whole lot of money. There's this bit at the beginning where they have a promo of like Cartoon Network movies and they have all of their other shows. And it just really makes me wonder what it would have been like had this movie been financially successful. We could have gotten all these other cartoon movies that were just never to be because no one saw the Powerpuff Girls movie. The Tom and Jerry movie in 1992 had probably one of the most controversial transitions to the big screen in that they decided that Tom and Jerry should talk. How come you never spoke before? Well, there was nothing I wanted to say that I thought you'd understand. As it turns out, Tom and Jerry have been able to speak this entire time and just have decided not to, and can also communicate with humans, but only orphans, apparently. Which I don't hear a lot about, but it feels like to me one of those things that people would get really upset about. I didn't love this one though, to be honest. I actually liked their voices, but they don't speak as much as you would think they would for something that's headlining the movie. The whole thing is about like an inheritance fraud scheme that Tom and Jerry are sort of just there for. For. I like the concept of where it starts off with that Tom and Jerry's owners leave them behind by accident So they end up on the streets and have to like be friends to take care of each other But it very very quickly derails and just becomes about something else when I guess they ran out of ideas of what to do for a Tom and Jerry movie And also it's a musical because I guess if they could talk now they may as well fucking sing too They have done like 20 billion straight to DVD Tom and Jerry movies since but this has been the only theatrically released one And then the movie didn't do well so they just never had them speak ever ever again. And our last theatrical one is also our most recent, which is the Bob's Burgers movie, which I also haven't seen the show of. <laughs> I don't watch a lot of TV, okay? This one reminds me a ton of the Simpsons movie in terms of like that huge leap in animation quality, but it, it feels extra special to me because I mean, when was the last time you can remember a 2D animated movie coming out in theaters? Like honestly, but unfortunately it didn't do very well either. I assume because of that mentality of like, why would I want to watch a cartoon at the movies when I can just watch it at home? It feels like a very expensive movie, more so than any of the other ones in this video. Even if the plot isn't quite as large scale as the Simpsons movie, it's just about, you know, uncovering a murder. This one is also a musical, but I actually really like the songs, but there's only like three of them in the movie, I think. Three or four. It's actually the first time I've ever wanted more songs from a musical, which has never happened before. Anyway, I didn't catch this one in cinemas either because I just ran out of time, so I'm just as bad. I'm sorry, Mr. Bob Berger. I really wanted to do this cartoon movies thing as one big 
made video talking about the theatrical and then made for TV ones, but I've been filming for like two hours and I really need to pee. So I might actually break this up into two parts uh, if this one does well enough. And then I can do a separate video talking about the other made for TV ones like Ben 10, Secret of the Omnitrix and Teen Titans, Trouble in Tokyo. I've still got another, I'm on page five of 11 of the notes I took. So it's still got a long way to go. <laughs> Even for the ones I didn't like, theatrically released cartoon movies just have a special place in my heart. It doesn't matter how old I get, I think it will always feel really special getting to see something I always see on TV on a big cinema screen. But with the Bob's Burgers movie not doing really well, despite them taking a pretty huge risk with it, I think we'll be seeing more of these with streaming now, which I think is a fine middle ground for me because you still get ones like Invader Zim Enter the Floorpiss, which clearly has a much bigger budget than the show and still looks incredible, even if it didn't come out in cinemas. So I'm fine with that as long as they keep making these. Anyway, thanks for watching and I will see you guys next time.